Welcome to sermons from St. Paul's Lutheran Church of Minot, North Dakota. St. Paul's is anchored in the message of Christ crucified for the forgiveness of sins, for the church and for the world. The following sermon is from Rev. Dr. Matthew Richard. Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 16th chapter. Jesus also said to the disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be manager. And the manager said to himself, What shall I do? Since my master is taking the management away from me, I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do, so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, How much do you owe my master? He said, A hundred measures of oil. He said to him, Take your bill and sit down quickly and write fifty. Then he said to another, And how much do you owe? He said, A hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, Take your bill and write eighty. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of this world are most shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. In the name of Jesus. Amen. My friends, the parable from our gospel reading in Luke this morning has to be one of the most difficult of all the parables that Jesus taught. That stated, we get a little help from Jesus at the end portion of our reading today, where Jesus wraps everything up by saying this, and I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. But even this explanation, though, it leaves us asking some very, very difficult questions. For example, why is wealth unrighteous? And when does this wealth fail? And this one, who are these friends who welcome us into the eternal dwellings? Indeed, who are these friends who welcome us into the eternal dwellings? Indeed, these are tough questions and a difficult parable, but let us pause and slow down and ask these questions yet again and take a little bit more time to consider them. First, unrighteous wealth. What does this mean? Well, Martin Luther once stated that the wealth in this gospel reading is called unrighteous simply because we so often use wealth in unrighteous ways. Consider, my friends, greed for a moment. Yes, greed. Greed, it actually comes about when you and I take unbelief and mix it with wealth and then sprinkle a little bit of covetousness on top. Indeed, taking a little bit of greed, it comes about by unbelief mixed with wealth, sprinkled and dabbed with a little bit of covetousness on top. Greed, it makes wealth unrighteous. Because our fists with unbelief become so tight-fisted that we can't let go of money by giving it to anyone else because unbelief says this to us, who knows if there will be enough for tomorrow, so I better cling on to it right now. And then covetousness comes along and it says this, you know what, greed, you are right, and we also need a fancy new widget to be happy, just like the Johnsons down the street. And so greed and covetousness, they pervert wealth, making it unrighteous. You see, greed forgets the Old Testament lesson about manna in the Old Testament story of the Israelites, who would store up extra manna, resulting in that manna ultimately becoming full of maggots and beginning to smell. 
Indeed, greed goes the way of unbelief and believes that there will never be enough in the future, that God will not provide for us in the future, so it is up to us to get while the getting's good. And covetousness, well, covetousness that comes along and it makes our eyes wander to other things and it whispers into our ears, hold on to that wealth. For you need that new widget to be happy. You need that thing to be whole and secure, just like the Johnsons down the street. This is why the Lord's Prayer, my friend, teaches us to pray for, get this, daily bread. That is to say, in the Lord's Prayer, we pray for our daily needs, not tomorrow's bread and not next week's bread and not next year's bread, but daily bread. We pray for the basic necessities right before us today, trusting that the Lord is the giver of all good things and that he will sustain our bodily needs in the future. We pray for daily bread, praying that the Lord would give us our daily needs, the air that we breathe, the water that we drink, the food that we eat, the homes that shelter us, and the government that protects us. But You see, there is great silliness, though, in our thinking, in all of our thinking in life, we, we begin to think that life is about accumulating stuff. All too often, people learn this the hard way. Yes, they believe bigger is better, so they get more and more and more stuff. They get and they get and they get. They buy so many things that they have to buy bigger things to hold the smaller things. And in the end, when they are dying or becoming too weak, they can't take care of it, they are then burdened to get rid of the small and the big things, indeed burdened to get rid of them, because these things are indeed weighing them down, because ultimately they know that they can't take it with them. You see, we forget our Lord's words that life does not consist in the abundance of one's possessions. Even the world realizes the foolishness of this way of thinking. Think of that common bumper sticker. He who dies with the most toys, yes, still dies. But my friends, I wonder if the Lord calls it unrighteous wealth, not merely because of our bad use of it, but because wealth fails to make it into the kingdom of God. Keep in mind that the kingdom of God is not a new Mercedes-Benz or a gold Rolex or an impressive 401k. No, the kingdom of God, as explained by scripture, is righteousness. It is peace. It is joy. It is the Holy Spirit for us. You see, what will, yes, what will make it into the kingdom of God is people. People who surround us all the time. People who stand in various kinds of need. People whom we can bless in countless ways are what and whom will make it into the kingdom of God, not our meaningless stuff. Remember that dishonest manager from our parable this morning? He was commended not for his dishonesty, but he was commended, get this, for his shrewdness his single-minded dedication to improving his situation. He saw what was coming in the future, and he made plans for people to welcome him because when he lost the funds that he once had, he knew that they would welcome him. See, those funds would not be following him into that future time. He would lose all of those funds, but the people to whom he showed kindness and goodwill to, well, those people, they benefited from his generosity. And they would remember him. He made friends by the means of his stuff. For he knew that these friends would remain even when the stuff did not. Now are you seeing Jesus' point in the parable this day? And he actually says that even the pagans seem to get this. And sometimes these pagans, they get it more than us Christians. In other words, pagans have a sense of figuring out that we can't take this stuff with us when we die. But unfortunately, we Christians, we sometimes struggle with this mentality, even as the enlightened baptize. Dear friends, your wealth, yes, your wealth will not make it into the kingdom of God, There will not be any stock portfolios, no dollar bills, no Benjamins, no fat checking account, and no wallet in the kingdom of God. 
you exit this world as you entered it, naked. You carry nothing out of this world because you carried nothing into it. But my friends, on that last day, we must remember this. We must remember that you and I will be surrounded by all the dead that Christ Jesus will indeed raise unto himself. And many of them will be people that we have known. Yes, people that we've crossed, that our paths have crossed in this life, in this journey of life under the sun. They will be there right with us, with resurrected bodies, proclaiming the Lord's glory in his presence. And so, the good news that we get to hear is that we get to invest in our future. Invest in these brothers and sisters in Christ, those who will be with you at that great last day. You see, baptized saints, it is quite simple. Look around in this church right now to the brothers and sisters sitting around you in these pews. These are your brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus who are blood-bought Christians just as you are. These are your brothers and sisters in Christ who will be with you at that great eschaton, the great last day. They are your brothers and sisters who will be with you for an eternity before the Lamb of God. Therefore, you get to love them right now. You get to share with them your earthly possessions. You get to give to them. You, you actually get to grab the dinner check out of their hands, wrestling it out of their hands to pay for it, to show them that grace and love that you have in Christ. Buy them a gift. Spoil them on their birthday. For these are people that you will experience glory and love with at that great eschaton. You see, you cannot take your wallets with you into the kingdom. But your brother and sister in Christ, well, they will be with you. They will be with you in the kingdom of God and in the Lord's kingdom someday with joy. You will see them and you will both dance as they throw their arms around you and you welcome each other into that kingdom of God. After all, dear baptized saints, that is exactly what the teller of this parable did for us. Jesus is the one who told us this parable, this story, and this is exactly what he does for us. Jesus, he, he noticed his neighbor, which is you and me. That would be indeed be us. He noticed us in our need, and he didn't count a single thing that was his as his own. But he gave it all up for us, to befriend us, to care for us, to provide for us that heavenly home. And Jesus not only gave up all that was his, but he assumed all that was ours. Not only our flesh and blood, but also the horrible debt of our sin. And he paid it as his own, with the righteousness that was his alone. His cross is where he has made himself friends for centuries upon centuries for us as humans. And he invites us into the same way of living Indeed, he invites us into the same way of living. He shows us that giving up everything, even life itself, for the service of another is what love does. Indeed, it is what love does. And the wonderful thing about love is that death cannot destroy love. His love proves stronger than the grave, and he rose again to be the first to welcome home his many friends into the eternal dwellings he prepared for them. And in his supper today, and this most precious and glorious supper, he reaches to you with the fullness of that love, forgiving you of your sins, even those where you have used wealth unrighteously in greed and covetousness. And in the Holy Supper, he not only forgives you of all of your sins, but he strengthens you to believe that a life lived in service to your neighbor is the only sort of life that is worth living. Because your neighbor in Christ, not stuff, will be in glory with you. Baptized saints, remember this wealth that you've been given. It is all gift given to you. It is all gift that gives to you. And these gifts, though, keep in mind, they do not last. But by the grace of the Holy Spirit, use the stuff that doesn't last to bless the people that do. That is the hope. That is the message of the parable. God be praised. God be praised indeed. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Thy strong word bespeaks us.
Thank you for listening to today's podcast sermon. You can access a full manuscript of today's sermon from Pastor Matthew Richard's blog at www.pastormatrichard.org or visit St. Paul's website at www.stpaulsminot.org. The Lord bless and keep you. Yeah.